Hi there, this is Robin Norgren, and I'm your host of Montessori Creativity and the Meaning of Life. You can find all the work that I do on Instagram uh, under Robin underscore Norgren or at UBU for Life. I'd like to begin with some words from The Cloister Walk by Kathleen Norris. Before my husband embarked on his South Seas journey, he installed a large National Geographic map of the region on the stark white wall by the kitchen table. When he called last night, he just arrived in Rarotonga in the Cook Islands. I found the words on the map and fingered them as we spoke. I fingered them again at breakfast to keep him in my presence. It's our 15th anniversary. He's staying at the Paradise Inn. We didn't pick our wedding day for any particular reason. We eloped, continuing what has become a family tradition on my mother's side. Both my grandmother, Totten, and my mother eloped when young, probably too young, and then built of this folly's, this folly marriages that endured for close to 60 years. We've had just one church wedding within the last 70 years, and it resulted in our one divorce. One day, in a library reference room, I became curious to know if the date of our wedding had any significance in the Christian tradition. When I discovered that it was the feast of the archangels, I got giggles and left before the librarian would have to throw me out. I have saved up things to tell David. A monk who complained to me about the resistance to change he'd encountered at work, who said, it's the well-worn idol named but we've never done it that way before. Exasperated, he'd said, and people wonder how dogmas get started. David laughs. He knows this is the Feast of Archangels and tells me that he's discovered that in the native language of Tonga, whales are the messengers of the gods, performing a function much like the eagle in Lakota religion or angels in Christianity. In Nuku'alafa, which means the city where love lives, he purchased an amulet of a whale's fluke, representing the divine messenger who moves between our world and that of the Creator, who lives at the bottom of the sea. The woman who sold it to him said it had been blessed by a Methodist bishop, but he could also take it to a priest of the old religion. I did, he said. It cost me a six-pack of beer and a carton of cigarettes, he says happily. I am happy to think of him walking around paradise wrapped in blessings. At morning prayer, the psalms seem suited to the archangels. Psalm 29 for Michael, the power of God. The Lord's voice resounding on the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord on the immensity of waters. And for Gabriel, Psalm 25, a quiet prayer of hope and trust. For Raphael, a psalm that I love, 147. The Lord builds up Jerusalem and brings back Israel's exiles and heals the brokenhearted and binds up all their wounds. Michael, who is as God. Gabriel, God's messenger. Raphael, God's healing. They say what the angels always say, do not fear. From Chris Killebeau's book, The Happiness of Pursuit. Tom Allen had everything going for him, or so it seemed. This young university graduate in England was in a funk. He struggled with a sense of dissatisfaction and a deep yearning to break out of what had become a traditional life path. I was sick of not being in control of my own decisions, he said. I had that terrible feeling that other people were steering my life. The inspiration for Tom's journey came from a job screening process he went through around the time of his graduation. 
He'd sailed through the company's exams and impressed the human resources rep who interviewed him. We'd like to invest in our employees, the rep told him, which sounded good to Tom. We want people to commit for the long term, the rep continued, which didn't sound as good. When his interviewer called back to officially offer an employment contract, Tom was surprised to find himself asking for time to think it over. He'd won out several other candidates in precisely the field he'd trained for. True, the work wasn't highly engaging, but with a good salary and job security, what was the problem? The problem was that Tom had another idea in mind, and the idea wouldn't leave him. When he finally turned down the job, explaining that he wanted to see more of the world first, he could picture the HR rep shaking his head on the other end of the call. Better get it out of your system, the interviewer said. It's a shame to pass up a good job. Better get it out of your system. Tom wasn't sure if this longing to explore was something he had to get out of his system, for he knew it wasn't going away. A cycling trip around the world was just the kind of ludicrous idea that made sense to a young guy who wanted to do something different. He managed to rope in a couple friends, Mark and Andy, and the three set out on a journey they expected to take at least one year. If the idea was ludicrous, the planning was almost non-existent. Tom was the de facto leader of the trip, yet had little cycling experience. A previous jaunt to the Scottish Highlands had resulted in confidence, but not much knowledge of traveling in difficult conditions where he didn't speak the language. He knew nothing about gear. His travels abroad were limited to a few countries that weren't very challenging. In his own words, he was an absolute beginner and 100% naive. Nevertheless, the group left their English, English village traveling south through the countryside on to the Netherlands, and eventually to Turkey in more challenging destinations. The joys of inexperienced cyclists traversing unfamiliar regions with little money quickly gave way to weariness. Missing his girlfriend, Mark returned to England, leaving Tom and Andy behind. Holed up for the snowy winter in Tbilisi, Georgia, Andy decided to stay on while... Tom continued to journey alone. A documentary film he made after the trip shows Tom cycling through the desert of Sudan, camera mounted to his bike's handlebars. He had no map and travels village to village looking haggard. Feeling ill, at, he at one point opts for a local treatment that involves bloodletting. Alas, the treatment is unsuccessful, and in another village, he learns he has malaria. It's rough going, but through it all, we can see Tom gaining confidence and experience. As rough as it was, after a year of intentional homelessness, Tom had adapted to the challenges of life on the road. The low points of struggling up hills and cycling into deserts were offset by moments of joy at realizing how far from England he'd come. Strangers would flag him down and offer bottles of beer. He would gaze out at the winding roads leading to snow-capped mountains, seeing new parts of the world with the eyes of an experienced traveler. Gone was the naive young man who had left his home on a whim. Tom Allen was now road-tested and flying high on his bike as he moved from country to country. It's so much more important to do what your heart's telling you, he said to the handheld camera. The quest was underway. This is an interview that I chronicled in my book, Your Creative Peace, Finding and Deepening Your, Inner, your Creative Voice While Connecting with God. The artist's name is Marsha Zimmerman. And she's a painter. As most women wear many hats, I am a wife to a wonderful, supportive, and loving husband and a mother to two beautiful and fun-loving kids. We live in North Little Rock, Arkansas and love spending time with our family, fishing, and playing together outside. What is one of your earliest creative memories? 
In fifth grade, I decided for some reason, I don't remember, to draw the cover of Disney's Beauty and the Beast. Though not, quote, creative, unquote, it is at that moment that I realized that I had the ability to draw from what I saw. My teacher even made copies for the class to color. I was famous. How did you find your creative voice? A voice. That is something I've been searching for since I was a child. To have the ability to speak up, unhindered by fear, doubt, or insecurity is a treasure. A treasure the Lord is helping me to uncover bit by bit. As my Jesus has brought me through many trials, he's rescued me from deep depression, preserved my life from the many attempts by others to destroy it, and healed me completely. He has revealed to me that I have a voice because I am his beloved and he is with me always. He created me with a purpose and a plan and has great works for me. It was this revelation that brought me from darkness into life, gave me hope and helped me to begin to accept and embrace who I am in Christ Jesus and the gifts he has given me. Through this healing and new understanding that I am here on earth on a mission for the Most High, I have been able to surrender my life that God may use me as he will. And though this has come, and through this has come the revelation of my voice. Over the last few years, God has shown me how to put onto canvas what I am thinking and feeling. What a journey. Did your creative habits make a smooth transition into your adult life? As a child, I was always led in the direction of the medical field, for that is what my dad knew, and that is where the money is. My gift was never encouraged or applauded or appreciated as far as I knew. I did have an art teacher in high school, Miss McLean, that the Lord used to open my own eyes to the fact that I truly had a gift and also to encourage me not only to pursue, but also to teach art. But what do you do with art? Who will that help? These were the questions I was always find, finding coming to me at the moment I would even attempt to dream about the possibility of pursuing art. I wrestled with this while in college. I even joined the ROTC under a nursing scholarship because I wanted to do something that mattered to everyone else. But I've learned the long and hard way after dropping out of college and working other jobs since that as long as you're trying to live or even function differently than the way your creator designed you to, you will never be at peace. Once you trust your maker, that he knows your every passion, desire, need, your gifts, talents, and all that stir inside of you, that is where true peace comes. Isaiah 26, 3, For I will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is steadfast, because he trusts in me. This truth could never be more alive than right now. For in the midst of an absolute unknown in regards to my artwork, Jesus continues to pour out daily his love, grace, mercy, and provision. Most of the people in my world right now think I am out of my mind, staying at home and painting and only having my husband's income. And there have been times of doubt times that I was ready to give up and just go get a job. But moments like these are what help to assure me even more that I am right when I'm supposed to be. There's a verse that keeps coming to me in these times of doubt. Acts 5.29 Stand firm, obey God, and not man. Over the last year, he's proven himself over and over again as Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. He is the provider and will supply all my needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus, Philippians 4.19. Any gift or ability he has that we have is from God and to be used as a tool to spread the gospel and bring glory to the Father. If you had a creative hiatus, what event or circumstance brought you back to your creative life? 
Seven years ago, while working in my church's daycare, the children's minister asked me if I could paint some canvases for her son's bedroom. Then I did some work for a friend of hers. It was one of these pieces that was seen by a local gallery that led to an invitation to bring in some work that I did not at the time have. But the call came just at the right time as I was leaving my overnight job from the hospital, just at the time when I was wondering what the next step God had for me, because taking the hospital job was about was an absolute God thing, as was leaving the job. But honestly, painting is something I never liked, nor wanted to do, nor thought I could ever do well. But with the encouragement of my husband and being led by the Holy Spirit to do so, I set out on this adventure. God has shown me how I can use it as a tool to spread the gospel and that it will be provision for the mission he's called me to. By the end of the year, I had made seven pieces. I did take them to the gallery, but decided against this route, which then led me to Etsy, where I've been successful.